Okay, so we're about to uh, begin an interview with uh, Peter Dimmel. Uh, it is November 30th, 2015. We are in St. John's, Newfoundland, and the interviewer will be William McRae. So just to begin, could you please state your full name? It's Peter Murray Dimmel. And your age, please? Uh, 69. And where were you born? I was born in Clacton-on-Sea, Essex, in the UK. Okay. Um, what did your parents do as a child? Uh, Dad was a uh, Canadian Forces, uh, was in the Canadian Army during the war. My mom was a war bride. Okay. So we came over here after the war, or okay. she came over after the war. How old were you when, uh, when you moved to Canada? Uh, first time I was a year or two. Uh, it was five times back and forth before I was 10. Uh, and uh, on ocean liners, of course. So uh, I had a, it was an interesting uh, time. I don't remember much of it, but mm -hmm. I remember living in, in the UK and just outside London, a place called New Malden, and uh, going, taking soccer lessons and that type of thing. But uh, I don't remember a heck of a lot more than that. So when I came back to Canada, I started in grade four. Okay. And you were you kept moving back and forth because of your dad? Yeah, dad was, it was the end of the war. He came mm -hmm. back. Uh, he got out of the forces for a bit, uh, became an Indian agent of all things on the uh, Tyndanaga Indian Reserve in, uh, near Deseronto in the Bay of Quinte area. And then he, he actually uh, got rejoined the forces, was posted to the UK one time and posted to Germany another time. And a lot of that was because my mother was, uh, was homesick, being a okay. war bride, it's the first time out of the UK. For sure. Hmm. Um, and you as a child, uh, other than, I mean, the first few years spending a lot of time uh, back and forth at sea, uh, what were your what were your pastimes? What were your go-to activities? Well, when I was uh, we lived in Deseronto, and then we moved to Kingston. Uh, moved to Deseronto after in grade nine or after grade nine, and moved to Kingston and lived there. I did grade ten, eleven. Uh, sorry, yeah, ten, eleven in Kingston, and then uh, moved to Fredericton, New Brunswick. Did grade eleven and twelve there. They put me back in grade eleven because I said my French wasn't good enough, which was true. Uh, and then uh, I went to Camp Borden. Um, my dad was posted to Borden, and uh, he uh, I did grade 13 in Borden. So I actually went to uh, to four high schools, wow. <laughs> which is not most most kids can't say that. Uh, but uh, my dad was a recruiting sergeant when he came back to uh, to Canada the last time, and one of his jobs was to go around and people that were you know, that were getting applying to come into the army, they do the background checks on them. And so he went around all over southern Ontario, right up to Bancroft, up to, I guess, you know, Bancroft would probably be as far north as he went. And in Bancroft, because it's a mineral collecting area, he got to know people. One of the people he would visit most of the time would be uh, barbers, because the barbers knew most of the people in town. They'd cut their hair, they'd know them very well, so they were good background checks. Gossip and everything. Yeah, gossip and right. things. And uh, so he'd go in there, and one of the barbers in ba Bancroft that he went in to see was a mineral collector. So uh, and I got, for some reason, I had found a piece of quartz crystal, uh, which I still have, that, my, that I, some relative, I think it was my grandfather in the UK, had found on the Epsom Downs. And I was very intrigued with that, so I sort of liked mineral collecting. So he started bringing me minerals back from Bancroft, and that's what got me interested into, oh. into mineral collecting first, and then really geology down the road. So uh, <clears throat> what did, after high school, what did you decide to do? Uh, well, I, I made up my mind, sort of going through high school, that I would be a, uh, a geologist. Uh, question was, where was I going to go? Uh, you know, I applied to uh, Queens, didn't get in. Again, my, my marks weren't good enough. Uh, that was what I was in coming out of grade 13. As so I applied to UNB, I could have got into UNB after grade 12 quite easily because I had very good marks. Uh, grade 13, they dropped off. Uh, again, moving around. And uh, I applied to UNB, and I was accepted not in first year science, but second year arts. So that's why I went to University of New Brunswick and uh, started in second year arts, switched at the end of second year, or at the end of the first year to second year science. And that gave me a lot of problems because I was, didn't have the grounding in first, mm -hmm. first year chemistry, math, and physics. So I had problems all the way through because of that. Geology wise, I was okay, but the rest of the sciences I was I had problems with. And I was a good student, I just didn't have the grounding there. Yeah. So So uh, so you, you really enjoyed geology but not necessarily uh, the other sciences. 
Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. I didn't enjoy them. It's just I didn't have the grounding in them. I had because I had high school stuff. But grade yeah. thirteen is not equivalent to first year university. Yeah, no kidding. And, yeah, and, and, and that was yeah. the, and that was part of the problem. Um, you know, looking back, retrospect, I probably should have gone into UNB right after grade twelve mm-hmm. because I had an average. I was up in the high seventies. I would have got into UNB no problem. All of my friends at, at Fredericton High School went to UNB at that time, and. Uh, so I could have very easily got in, and I would have started in first year science. I don't think I would have had any problems. So you did graduate in uh, with a geology degree. Yes, yeah, okay. a, a bachelor of science with a major in geology. And what did you what What would you consider to be your first job after that? Uh, the first job was with Naranda Exploration in uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, now. At that time, it was quite easy to get geological jobs, uh, mineral exploration jobs primarily, in the summertime. So what, even after first year at UNB, which was my, my, I was taking geology courses even though I was in arts, second year arts, um, I worked with the, uh, with the university geology department, mostly in the lab, doing lab work and set, but also we got a little bit of field work in, uh, in southern New Brunswick and Grand Manan area, that sort of thing. And then the second year, I got a job with the Geological Survey of Canada, in a summer job, and worked with uh, uh, geologists that, you know, a geologist based in, in Ottawa, <coughs> Frank, Frank Anderson, F.D. Anderson. And he gave me a really good grounding in, in mapping and things like that, so sort of interesting. And then the third year, I got a job with, uh, I was offered six job, jobs for the summer of the third year. Went with a company called McIntyre Porcupine, another one that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and then that was in Newfoundland. And then the fourth year, Naranda was opening an office over here. They needed people who knew something about Newfoundland because I'd been there the summer before. I got on with Naranda and that became my permanent job. Okay. And I was offered two jobs, either in Co in Sudbury or Naranda in Newfoundland. Okay. And I went with Naranda. So heaven knows where my yeah. life would have gone otherwise, right? Why Naranda instead of Inco? Uh, I, I think it was because I've been in Newfoundland and I like Newfoundland. Yeah. Uh, now I'd spent most of the summer in the in the woods. I really wasn't out very much, but what I what I liked about it was just you know the wildness of it. In fact, you could get around quite easily, even though it was quite wild. You were never that far from a road, unlike say northern New Brunswick or or not northern New Brunswick, northern Canada mm-hmm. somewhere. Um, so I really liked that type of thing. I liked the people that I met, and I was intrigued with it. And I thought there was more opportunities. Uh, Sudbury was exploration in the summer, a beat geologist in the winter in one of the Sudbury mines, you know, one of Inco's mines. So, uh, again, retrospect, the Sudbury one, you know, I think all geologists should have underground experience, and I don't have that. But I think all exploration geologists, to be good ones, should have some underground experience, even a year or two, because they'd understand the three dimensional part of the ore bodies, right? Okay. And were you, as a geologist, I often <clears throat> this comes up. Were you really into the exploration part of it, or were you happy to do it, you know, as a younger student in the summers, but was hoping to uh, to have more of a, a permanent, uh, settled uh, job? No, I think I think when we started, uh, we especially in those days uh, when I when we first started with Naranda, we worked a five and a half day week. We worked till we we worked till Saturday noon. I mean, that was essentially the week we had, right? And uh, when we we're in the field, we worked seven days a week. I mean, then we work for four four weeks or something, and maybe have a week off then, or at least a few days off and stuff. There wasn't much office work. It was mostly field oriented. Um, I didn't really mind it at the time. I wasn't married. Now, as soon as you get married, it becomes a little different. But even then, presumably your wife understands it in the short term. It, it's when your kids come along that yeah. it becomes difficult and you know looking back at it there was a lot I missed raising the kids which I'm seeing with my grandchildren now that I missed with, with the children growing up right so but I, I think most of us accepted that's what we do now in today's world it's changed because people just aren't willing to do what we did back then which is no different than any other job I mean people aren't willing to do what was done in the past it's you know people want more and they expect more right yeah yeah, even involving you know, safety. Yeah. I mean, I got married on uh, I got married uh, on a Saturday in St. John's here, and I went in the woods on the Monday following. <laughs> yeah, and I was in there for three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> so I you know, I mean, or you know, in today's world that wouldn't happen, right? Mm-hmm. 
So can you take me a bit through your, it can be quickly through your career path and then we'll... Yeah, okay. Well, interject. I worked with Naranda in, in Newfoundland as a what they call a project geologist from uh, 1969 to 1982. In 1982, I was offered a job as a district geologist in, uh, in Bathurst, New Brunswick, and I was responsible for Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, outside of the Bathurst camp, except for the area around the Heath Steel Mine which was a company called Metogamy Lake Mine, which was combined with Naranda, they had operated that little area. So I was tasked with that, even though it was within the Bathurst camp, which didn't make a lot of sense, but it, it's the way it went. Um, in, uh, in 1986, uh, Naranda decided uh, that they didn't need me anymore. So uh, they laid me off. Uh, I immediately got a job temporary job with a company called Corona Corporation, well, Lacana Corporation, which became Corona Corporation within a year or two after that, working in New Brunswick, uh, in, out of the Bathurst area, so I was pretty well home every night, but, you know, went, went to different areas in, in northern New Brunswick. And uh, they decided to open a, uh, by 1988, they started working in Newfoundland, and uh, the, the project geologist, or district geologist they had for that, or regional geologist, I guess they called them at the time, he, uh, he quit and went with another company, so I needed somebody that knew something about Newfoundland. Of course, I had a lot of experience, so they offered me the job. I'd been working with them in New Brunswick anyway, so they offered me the job. I went over, I, so I spent the summer of 88 pretty well in Newfoundland, back and forth to Bathurst. And then uh, 1989, they decided to open an office. They asked me if I'd be the regional geologist. So that lasted till 92, when uh, Corona Corporation got taken over by Homestake and they rolled it in. They were going to keep, uh, keep myself and another geologist you know, It was based in, in Baldor. They were going to put us both in Toronto. We were going to look after Canada out of Toronto. And then they decided to wipe it all out and just go move to have a group in, in Vancouver. And I think that lasted a year or two, and then they closed that one too, and we retreated right back to San Francisco, oh, wow. <laughs> which is what happens in these things, right? So uh, I became a consultant in 92, uh, working with mostly junior companies. And then I worked with a number of juniors. Uh, Voices Bay, uh, Rush came along, 93, 94, 95. That sort of cemented that I started with one company, which I was a director of and involved in for a number of years. Became president of that one <clears throat> just before uh, uh, Brayex came along. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we couldn't raise any money, so that one went by the way. I actually got rolled into another company, which became Linear Gold, uh, ultimately Linear Resources, and it was Linear Gold, became Brigus Gold, and just got taken over by uh, another company just recently. So I was, I was president and director of that for a number of years. And then uh, in three or four years ago, I became president of a junior company called Silver Spruce Resources. And I up, I was president of that till February of this year when I resigned from that. So and this year, very little work being done. Uh, I become uh, just really a, an unpaid consultant. I'm I working with different groups to mm -hmm. to on various properties, <coughs> but there's no money to pay me. So it's more or less sweat equity to earn either an interest or or just to help people and hopefully they can raise some money down the road and yeah. I can get something out of it. And it keeps you busy too. And I've staked a few claims of my own over the years too, different times when I've been unemployed as such, nothing going on, always without conflicting with anybody I'm working for. And uh, some of those properties I still own. So I want to have them optioned to different different groups. So. Would you consider yourself uh, retired at this point, or no? I no, no. definitely semi-retired, semi -retired. and and probably yeah, quite quite less semi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I go to the office just about every day. I okay. mean, the advantage I've got is it's my office. It's just we bought an old house down on the Marchant Road, just up the hill from from the Delta there, and. Uh, it's, you know, I go there and I do stuff, but phone doesn't ring. You know, I mean, days go by, the phone doesn't ring. Emails have dropped off to, you know, a, a hundred to what they used to be and stuff. Most of it, of course, lately it's advertising. But, um, yeah, you know, it's, it keeps me busy. Uh, I, I do a, one thing I missed too. I'm, I was the, myself and a partner reactivated the old Rambler uh, base metal mine over in Bayvert in the 90s, mid 90s, around the same with the Voices Fund, same time as the Voices Bay uh, Discovery. And we operated that for eight months as a copper mine. 
uh, did very well with it actually we had about six million dollars in the bank and I owned 15 percent of it at the time and uh, and then we the copper price dropped we had to spend a lot of money to go down which is what Rambler the main Rambler mine which is still which has started operating again uh, that's what they're doing now copper price dropped down to 80 cents a pound or something uh, where we've been getting a dollar twenty uh, there's a lot of money had to go in to get underground further down we, we just didn't have the money to do it switched we so we switched over to gold put a gold concentrator in but we just didn't make it work it just didn't work for us we didn't have people that knew how to do that uh, yeah. we hired the wrong people and a number of things like that so it just never worked so we almost went bankrupt essentially so that closed down the only thing that came out of that I do have a small NSR net smelter return on Rambler now which is my really only income at this time I just hope they don't close down so <laughs> they only started two three years ago so uh, what they're working on is something that'll give them 21 years of my life so if that's the truth then that's my my uh, retirement yeah. but I hope it is right? mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that I mean partly on that topic is there um, is there either a period in your life or a specific job or project that you were that comes out at you as being uh, dysfunctional I don't think any specific project becomes as dysfunctional um, thought about that that question quite a bit um, the when I started with with Naranda and at that time most of us to get out first of all in the summertime most of us had jobs because the major companies were doing regional exploration what we call grassroots exploration um, we would get jobs doing stream sediment sampling, uh, soil sampling, a little bit of mapping, prospecting, etc. Prospecting wasn't pushed, but you know because they had prospectors per se that did that, right? But we were supposed to do the geology, tie the prospecting, and find a rock. What type of rock is it? Where is it? That type of thing. Um, that was what was done. So most of us had jobs. Uh, when we got out, there was a lot of people being hired by these major companies to do mineral exploration and continued and for example Noranda when I was district geologist in Bathurst we had 21 districts across the across the country we each district had two or three minimum of two probably three sometimes four project geologists working under us so you can do the math on that you're talking 100 120 uh, we had five or six regions e each region had a manager and assistant manager in it so you was somewhere around 120 people working directly with Naranda exploration that wasn't Naranda mines this was Naranda exploration looking for the mines that would feed Naranda mines right and uh, you know it was a good system <clears throat> but it was when times got bad they they cut the funding so you'd be sitting there with this group of people and essentially you'd be paying salaries you didn't have much money to do out anything outside uh, we ran in Newfoundland for years uh, with a half million dollar budget and of that probably 200 grand of that was salaries mm -hmm. now we weren't getting paid very much at the time because when I started with uh, with Naranda I think my salary was uh, what was it eight hundred dollars a month something like that so it wasn't very much but you know it, it and it gradually increased as as everything else did but uh, it it the system seemed to work the problem was when uh, when things changed when Matogamy Lake came in there was a guy by the name of John Harvey took over he tried to make Naranda which was a big organization very similar to Matogamy Lake Exploration which was a small company and there was too much oversight on the top <coughs> the company the guys on the ground who had were given a budget to do a job were not allowed to do their job <clears throat> and I saw that we were actually judged on variances on our budget the variances on the budget was uh, if you were if you had a fifty thousand dollar budget for a property and you spent sixty that was a ten thousand dollar budget uh, or a variance but if you only spent forty it was still a ten thousand dollar variances and they would add those up and do a percentage and they would reward you uh, reward you uh, with whoever had the smallest variances were considered to be the better geologist or better managers type things right but what I looked I saw there it was the people that were doing that where they were balancing the budgets because you could apply to take money from this one and put it to that but it would take you a week or two to do that because you had to justify it you had to do everything right 
So you could have guys doing that instead of being exploration. What I what I noticed was the guys that found things were the guys that for, said to hell with it. They had the worst variances of anyone. But what they did was they did their job. And I think that was the biggest mistake that Miranda made. They hired people, very capable people, but they didn't let them do their job. There was always this oversight. Okay. You had to prove this, you had to write, you'd spend, you'd spend, we used to get ready for budget meetings. It'd take us a month to get ready for budget meetings because we had to prove, we had to have Just all the maps. Files. We had to lay it out, we'd get the header as a big group and everything else, and it was, it was so counterproductive, and that's what I saw. The other thing I didn't see uh, really bothered me was, was you didn't get a lot of support from your manager and assistant manager. You got blamed when something got went wrong, and they took the credit when something went right. So there wasn't and, a lot of trust. No, well, it, 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 to me, it was exactly what uh, the way not to manage. And and one of the assistant managers had actually said to me one time, he said, you know, we expect uh, loyalty from our subordinates. And I said to him, well, I said, you know, the problem with loyalty, it's earned, it's not given. And they, they just didn't do it. They didn't show that to the people. And I mean, you, you know, that is a big mistake. I think that was one of the reasons that Naranda Exploration really wasn't that successful. People used to say a great property to pick up is one that Naranda dropped. Because they, they would go so far, they pick it up and they do all the right work. The work would be good for so far, but they wouldn't be allowed to finish it. So somebody else would pick it up and drill the next hole or drill something like this and, you know, continue on with it and they'd find something. Yeah. So. So that's, I guess, that was the, the biggest thing that I found over the years. Uh, when I went with Corona Corporation, I was, I was given task to find a mine if I could. You know, this thing where we the Pine Cove deposit, which is under development there at uh, now, is actually Anaconda Gold over in, on Bay Verde area. They are mining that right now. That was a deposit that we took when it had 11 holes. I went in and looked at it, 11 drill holes, and I said, "This looks like a significant deposit." So we took it to the point where. It exactly. It really hasn't changed a heck of a lot since we outlined the, the deposit. Uh, so it was with Corona, right? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> it's, you know, we had success with Naranda. I drilled a hole on the Point Leamington deposit. First hole we drilled got 240 feet of massive sulfides. It's still not a mine because the grade isn't there in the metallurgy's problem. But it's, uh, it was, it's still probably the biggest massive sulfide deposit on the island of Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. You know, um, which is which is quite interesting, right? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, that was in 1971. I started in '69. So, but I was very junior. I was, I mean, all I was doing was, and then this is, I started telling you about the prospecting course. One of the things we did at the prospecting course was did a uh, uh, success stories. So I've been involved with Point Leamington. I was also involved with Telepon deposit. The top Telepon Duck Pond, which was just closed, uh, Tech Corporation op uh, operated it. Um, we found the boundary deposit about 1975-76. It wasn't started mining them. They started mining it about seven years ago, <laughs> finally. <coughs> so it took that long to, to take it there. We, we, we didn't actually find the duck pond deposit, which made the biggest, the biggest part of it, but we knew it was there because we were finding evidence of it, and it was all based on prospecting discoveries that a couple of prospectors out of the Benton area had made. Uh, a family of prospectors called the the, uh, the the Keats, and the Keats Stairs family are sort of popular. They became they got Prospector of the Year for the PDAC a number of years ago, be recognizing the, the the impact they've had on mineral exploration, particularly in Newfoundland and Labrador, but really right across the country, particularly in Eastern Canada. Okay. <clears throat> um, did you, um, you just mention the PDAC, did you uh, join any organizations for your career? Oh yes, yes, I've been pretty well all of them. I always believed that that's important, so I'm, a, I'm an actually a, a life member, I guess, or whatever they call it, honorary member of the CIM. So I joined them way back in my student days. Uh, I, I started with the PDAC probably trying to think the early 70s uh, I used to go to CIM meetings for the first number of years and then I switched over to the PDAC and I've been going so I've been a I'm a life member mm -hmm. of the PDAC also uh, when I was in New Brunswick with Naranda I became a regional representative at the time they had regional representatives when I moved to Newfoundland I became a regional representative for Newfoundland and then subsequent to that I became a director of the of the uh, of the association and then uh, and then I but anyway, I ended up as uh, 
in the executive, so I ended up as president in 2004, 2006, I think it was. I have trouble going back now, so I'm a past president of PDAC also. But <clears throat> still, I'm quite involved in, not quite, not heavily involved, but uh, because the directors are the ones that run the association. But the, as past presidents, we get we get invited to strategic planning sessions, these things on the, on the road, and we get uh, we get questioned, you know, we get calls on what do you think about this, what do you think about that. So it is still quite quite a good thing. PDAC. I've also been involved with Newfoundland Labrador Explorationists here as president. I was involved with the NBPDA as a president over there. I was involved with the Bailey Society when it was at the uh, at UNB uh, as president of that. Um, the Bailey Society. No, no, there's what? Big, no. This was a. It's a geological thing. Oh, sorry. Geology. What, what was it, sorry? Bailey Geological. Bailey, okay. Bailey Geological. I thought you said a debating society. <laughs> no, I, I don't know whether I'd make a good debater. <laughs> the uh, uh, also, uh, I'm a member, uh, associate member of the Association of, uh, of uh, what do you call it? Applied Geochemists. Uh, I'm also SEG Society for Exploration Geologists. I think it is SEG. Um, and you know various various companies. I got also past chairman and past executive director of the uh, what is now Mining Industry NL. It uh, used to be called Chamber of Mineral Resources when I was involved with it, and a director too of that. So yeah, I I always thought that industry industry organizations are very important to to mm -hmm. what we do because we have to we have to you know talk to we have to talk to the politicians and the bureaucrats and tell them this is what we do. I think that's part of the problem. Some of the decisions that are made are made by people who have no experience in our in our yeah. system. They don't understand what we're doing and why we're doing things. Well, here's a question for you. Do you think there's a, and I ask this question a lot, do you think there's a disconnect between uh, the general population, and this could include uh, government, uh, and the natural resource industry? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt that, that there is. Uh, I mean, the majority of people, especially in, uh, in places like Toronto, bigger cities, uh, they don't understand what we do, how we do it, etc. Um, all you have to hear is every time you, you know, somebody's out digging a mine, right? Well, you know, we don't dig mines, or we don't dig, you know, things like this. That's what we do at the end of it, but we don't do it, you know, in the early stage. Uh, most people, most people think mining is a dirty thing. They still yet. Uh, I had a neighbor here that said to me, you know, it's just terrible. You mining, you know, you make such messes, and you do this and you do that. And, I've been told all of the mines in Ontario, for example, don't take up as much land as, as Highway 401. You know, yeah. and I mean, you know, to me, well, that's that, and that's that was a number of years ago. That was true. Now, whether it's still you today, but you just think of how much room 401 takes up with its overpasses and its and its interchanges and how long it is and things like this and the amount of amount of land that that takes up. And this was <clears throat> at least 10 years ago. That was true. I don't know whether it's still true today, but you know that people have this idea about a mine taking a huge area and and just wiping it out forever, and that's that's what thing. But of course, with today's reclamation policies, uh, with the way things are done today, um, I had a neighbor here that said to me, "Oh, yeah, we're terrible. You guys do this, you do that, and everything else." And I said, "Well, what makes you think that?" things haven't changed. I said, all you're seeing is history, the historical part of what was done in the past. I said, okay, let me let me put this to you. How about if somebody want, decided to put an, uh, uh, a city somewhere and uh, they're gonna, it's, it's around a harbor and it surrounds the harbor and it's gonna take all the sewage from 100, 200,000 people, it's gonna dump all that sewage into the harbor. Oh, would that wouldn't be allowed? And I said, well, you're right, it wouldn't be allowed, but that's what St. John's does until about two years ago. That's what we did. Yeah, that's what Victoria still does. Yep. And that's what Montreal exactly. just did the other day. Yeah, that's right. So I said, you know what, why would you think we're any different? You know, I said, it was what was done. And I, and I well, you yeah, know, I never really thought about that because the problem is with it from a media perspective, we never get anything except when something goes wrong, you know? And and it's 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 a function of things. It's the same thing with oil spills and things like this. You know, I mean, somebody complains you spill ten gallons of hydraulic fuel when you're out doing a drill, right? On a drill thing, right? Well, this is a it's an ecological disaster. But you know, how how long ago was it we, we used to take oil, used oil, and put it on our roads, on our dusty roads? <clears throat> that was done years ago. That's what it was done. That's the way people did. When they changed the oil in their cars by themselves, what did they do with the oil? <coughs> You know where it went, right? 
So it's, it is frustrating from that perspective, and I think it's, uh, somebody said the other day, what we have to do is we have to talk to people, tell them what we do, tell them how we do it. Yeah, and, I, I know, was gonna ask you, do you think, because <clears throat> a lot of people still kind of, when they mention the mining industry especially, they'll say it's a sunset industry still, when, when really if you know a bit more about it, you know that there's still incredible innovation going mm -hmm. into many of these natural resources. Um, but do you think the industries maybe lately haven't done a good enough job to communicate how much things have changed, how, ma how much regulations have changed? Because uh, well, like you said, a lot of people only seem to picture the natural resources 50, 60 years ago, right? Well, I think the, the proactive, I think companies and, um, and our industry groups are becoming much more proactive. We're trying to do that in the, in the PDAC, CIM, ICMM, uh, uh, all of these companies, MAC, all of these groups are becoming much more, they have you know, TSM towards sustainable mining, they have uh, PDAC as E3, environmental excellence and exploration. Most groups have these systems now where they do it. Now, what we try to do is go to things and go to areas where we can talk about it. The prospecting groups here in, New in New Brunswick, in, in Newfoundland, go to, the, go to uh, fairs, you know, different places where they're having groups and little displays, and they'll go and they'll talk about prospecting and what mining and prospecting means to the to the province and how it's done. And those are the type of things we need to do. Now, in the past, it wasn't done as much, and I think again, people, it's sort of peripheral to what we do, but it's very important to what we do. And this experience of it, mining matters from the PDAC is teaching kids what mining does and how it's done and why it's important. And I think those type of initiatives are really important to this uh, thing. The Johnson Geo Center up on the hill here. If mm -hmm. you get a chance, you should go and have a look at that. Um, Paul Johnson, who just died a uh, month, a month and a half ago, he just lives over here in the corner. Um, he, he put about $6 million of the $10 million cost into that. He recognized that <clears throat> we need to do more to talk about the geological makeup of the province, why it's important to the people of the province. And that geo center goes a long way. So they have, uh, they have, you know, two or three thousand kids through a year. Uh, in fact, maybe more than that. I'm not right up to date on that. But uh, they have a lot of people, a lot of kids go through. A lot of uh, adults, they have cruise passengers coming through when the cruises come in. They'll go in there and stuff too. So you know, that's a type of thing that really helps to explain what we're doing and how we do it. <clears throat> yeah. It's on, uh, the Geo Center's on Signal Hill. Signal right? Hill, yeah, yeah, halfway up Signal Hill, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. planning on going when I, uh, I'm gonna take the nice hike. And oh yeah. I'm planning on doing that, that in the same day. <laughs> okay, <sure>. yeah. Um, <clears throat> maybe completely um, different topic here, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm no, uh, I'm no geologist, but uh, uh, reading a bit about you, what exactly is a qualified person? Okay, a QP is, yes. uh, this, is this is something that was established uh, after BREX and, and okay. some of the problems that had happened. There were a number of junior companies that really got into problems because of, well, I, I think it's fraud in some ways, but it was certainly a misstatement of facts. Uh, maybe, maybe really uh, people that just didn't know what they were doing could have been as bad as that, or it could have been on purpose. Some of them were on purpose, some of them were just people just being stupid and not understanding what they were looking at and, and putting out mis misleading information. Um, the, it was recognized that if we wanted to have any credibility as junior miners, junior mining mineral exploration people, we had to come up with something where we were then held responsible for it. Okay, so what they said was, okay, how are we going to do this? Uh, they got together the TSX, TSX Venture, uh, the uh, Canadian Securities Administrators, and but they came up with what they call 43101. 43101 sets out standards for mineral exploration, compliance of certain things, and also how you put that information out, and what you can say and what you can't say, based on things, and whether you whether you've got resources or whether you've got reserves, and there are definitions around those things. CIM did some work on that, and they, that the CIM, CIM definitions are used for the various reserves, mineral reserves, inferred, uh, uh, in, induced, or in, uh, what they call inferred, actual, anyway, whether, whether they're not, whether they're reserves or resources, which okay. is very important, because resources are very early stage, saying reserves are, you've defined them. So 
it shows how you have to define them or what, what it means for each one so people understand it because those terms were thrown around pretty easily before. It also says what you can say. You can't, you, you know, you can't say we think we've got a mind, for example, because it, 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 that just misleads people. You, you can't say that. <clears throat> you have to have of the reserves, you have to have this, you have to have economic parameters, you have to have various things because a mine is, a, is could be a mine at one time, say it gold at $2,000 an ounce and at $1,000 an ounce not a mine. Yeah, because it doesn't make money, which, you know, which doesn't, which makes sense. So, you know, those are the type of parameters that had to be done. So, <clears throat> and he said, well, how are we going to establish this? So what they did was they go to the various uh, professional engineers uh, associations across the country, in most cases, uh, and said, okay, how about registering geoscientists? You've got PNGs. Why don't we put in a situation where we register PGOs as the okay. same characteristic? So I sign myself as PGO. Okay. Peter M. Demo, PGO, which means I am a qualified person to write, depending on my education and depending, I, I can't sign off on on ore reserves and stuff because I haven't had the capability. I have never done those. Mm -hmm. It's not what I've been doing. So I really, I, if I did that, I'd be outside of my uh, scope of practice. But outside I can of sign off on mineral exploration things. It, even then, I'd have to look at some of them because I don't have a lot of experience, for example, in uranium, say in Athabasca. I would have to be really, you know, I'd have to look, uh, I'd have to look at that very hard before I signed off on anything in, in, in Saskatchewan, even though I'm registered in Saskatchewan. So what we did was we got registered. First one I got registered here was in Newfoundland here. So uh, Peganel, professional engineers and geoscientists in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I registered as grandfathered in, in early, early days, got registered. I'm now registered with the APGO, Association of Professional Geoscientists of Ontario. I'm registered temporarily with the Quebec group and I'm registered in Saskatchewan because one of the companies I'm involved with had some properties in Saskatchewan. They wanted me to sign off on news releases and things. So be a qualified person. You have to be, you have to have certain characteristics, certain um, educational and then background. It's, it's whichever. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then you apply to these groups, you get accepted. Once you do, yeah. then you're yeah, a QP. Okay. So the but, group looks at but it. But then you still have to go, you have to recognize what you're avail what you can do and then work within that scope of practice. Oh, okay. So it made it professional. So now I can, like a PNG, I can sign, if you were applying for a, uh, uh, what do you call it, passport, I could sign off on it. So I'm recognized professional otherwise. We never really were up until that time, right? Okay. So. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you had mentioned a bit, uh, and I guess this is further on in your career, but having been um, on boards of, of some uh, exp exploration uh, companies, yeah, some mining companies, um, are there any uh, are there any projects or findings that that uh, to you would be worth mentioning that you're you're proud of or, or that you think have well, been I'm proud pretty major? <coughs> <coughs> Looking back at the other day. Uh, when we did these uh, things at the Mineral Resources View, Review this year, I would say very intimately associated with the discovery of the Point Namington deposit. Unfortunately, it's not a mine, but it is the largest massive sulfide deposit that's been found on the island in, in general. It probably hasn't been drilled off yet because it's mostly pyrite, which is iron sulfide, not, not of interest. Um, but there is significant copper in it. Uh, the first drill hole we drilled into that was 240 feet of massive sulfides, about 1% copper. And significant gold. The problem with the gold is because the metallurgy is very, it's very fine-grained ore, very difficult to get the gold out. The best we could ever get in this recoveries was about 25 percent. Now I have no doubt at some point that deposit will be mined. Uh, also, also heavily involved with the uh, duck pond uh, deposit, uh, tally pond duck pond in the thing that one the tech just finished mining after uh, they operated for six, seven years, and uh, that was in the 70s and they mined it. Just, just closed down um, last fall, early this spring. Okay. So, you know, those type of things, very, very good. Um, personally, myself, uh, and, and I've got to give credit to those. Uh, I don't think either one of those would have been found without, the use, without these prospectors, particularly Al Keats out of, uh, out of Benton, which is out by Gander. Uh, prospector par excellence. I mean, he, he, just, he just really knows what he's doing. and. Uh, it's interesting, uh, one other thing I think you guys might think of doing is doing a history of, of discoveries of things across the, across the country. I think that would be really good to get that down on paper 
Um, that's what we did at our mineral resources review. We did Tally Pond, uh, Duck Pond, we did Point Leamington, and we did Valentine Lake, and we also did Boise's Bay. Al well, Joseph talked about the discovery of Boise's Bay, which is, of course, far bigger than any of these other ones. Valentine Lake is probably going to be our next gold mine on the province. And that was found by a, a guy when he was working, following up a soil survey. You know, now, you know, they, there's always luck involved in these things, but <clears throat> it's a lot of hard work, too, mm -hmm. and these type of things. Uh, personally, uh, I have one gold, gold zone that I found myself over in the Bay Bird area called Chrissy Zone uh, that I just, my, my daughter called Chrissy because it was, she was with me when she was 16. And we found a, a boulder that was full of free gold, and uh, she, uh, we had to stake it because it was ground staking at the time. We'd spend a day and a half staking it the day after we found it. And uh, she never went in the woods with me afterwards. But she's now a chiropractor. <laughs> Why not? Why well, not? Well, she was 16 and she, she never worked like that before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going through the woods, rain coming down, okay. mosquitoes and black not, flies. Not her type of a... Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> she's a chiropractor. She doesn't have to worry about it now. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I was really appreciative of the fact that she helped me with that. That was when, in 92, early 92. I still own that property. So I've got it. I just optioned it. I had an option to Rambler, the company that uh, that I was involved with over there in the Rambler mine. Right? It's just south of the Rambler mine in Bay Bird area. So it has three, three different gold zones on it, but Chrissy was the one that I really found. There was another zone up there that has gold mineralization in it that took, uh, it, it showed up in till samples, which are the glacial things it took me 17 years to trace that back to source <laughs> over the years it's something like chuck Pipke, except it's not as exciting yeah, yeah. chuck Pipke found tracing the tracing the diamonds back yeah. 300 kilometers to source to to find the caddy and these things eh? no but you know again that coming back to problems in our industry that's another thing that really bothered me because there were people walking around when chuck Pipke was walking around talking about these kimberlite indicator minerals and there were some very knowledgeable people involved in that. Um, uh, Hugo Dummett, guys like that, who really knew their stuff, had studied it and everything. But I knew, I heard people walking around at the PDAC saying, this guy's crazy. He thinks there's, uh, he thinks there's diamonds in Canada. Oh, well, <laughs> you know. Uh, another example of that is Sean Ryan and the, the white gold discoveries in the Yukon area. Uh, I, I've never worked in the Yukon. But I know people that have, and I've a I asked them, this is probably 10 years ago, you know, where did all of the placer gold in the Yukon, where did it come from? Well, don't know, it's all gone now. There's nothing left. Well, Sean Ryan proved that wrong, <laughs> you know. And I think that's where it's still coming from. It's, it's, it's in there, it's in the rocks, and they just weren't using the right type of things to uh -huh. discover it. So Sean Ryan goes in with a new, just new technique. But again, who was working with him? He was working off prospector grants, living in an unheated shack, he and his wife, yeah. for years, right? So, you know, it, to me, that's one of the biggest problems. We've got, we've got people in this industry that will really be naysayers and really put people down that are doing things a little different, right? Okay. Excuse me a minute. Just like... Okay, so the, uh, the next question is, uh, seems like a loaded question, but there's no wrong answer. It just, it's a mouthful to, uh, to hear. <laughs> so... Um, in your opinion, are there any events, uh, people, inventions, disasters, anything whatsoever, uh, really, that that you believe must be mentioned when talking about the natural resources uh, history in Canada? Well, I think I, I talked about it earlier was this discovery of diamonds because uh, okay. you know that's one of the things that's happened in my lifetime that uh, nobody looked for diamonds uh, when I was in university. Uh, it was the early 80s, really, before that became something that we that we, we should do, right? It's expensive. It's not for juniors, but uh, it, it showed it could be done. And, it, and again, it comes down to a guy like Chuck Fipke, who said, this, I believe, there's diamonds here, and he went at it. And discovery of the white gold stuff by Sean Ryan up in the... Uh, uh, up in the, the Yukon, it's a similar type of situation. Areas where people said, wrote it, and had written it off, had said, just doesn't exist, you know, the gold's gone, all that plastic gold, well, yeah, it was in the, in the earth, but now it's been all put in the rivers and it's gone. Well, he proved it wrong. So uh, I think those type of things show people they've got to question what they're told. Uh, Boise's Bay is an example, too, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, Boise's Bay was in an area that nobody was looking. 
there were companies, Falconbridge, for example, was looking in, in Labrador prior to the discovery of, of Voice Bay, but they weren't looking in that area because it really didn't fit the models of what people thought they should be looking for. Uh -huh. So uh, I think sometimes we're too model oriented, we're too oriented towards what's been done in the past, what's been found elsewhere. That's important because obviously it makes sense if you're looking for a Cambalda or a, what they call a, a, a sheep basalt type of uh, sin, you have to look for those type of, type of deposits in the same type of rocks. That makes sense. But there's always people finding something new. And, and I think what we, what we have to do is accept that that's going to happen and not uh, talk about people that, are, that have different ideas until, until we know really what's going on because these are the people that find, find things that then become in the mainstream and we look for other places. Yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, it's going to keep happening. But I think diamonds, uh, the white gold stuff in the Yukon more recently, um, Hemlo is another one. I mean, Hemlo... There were lots of little deposits around in Ontario and that part of Ontario, uh, and but people were not really spending any time there. The junior companies found it, and it, really that's one of the problems I'm seeing in today's world is the junior companies that have been made a lot of these discoveries don't have the money, can't raise the money anymore in today's world. Hopefully that'll turn around, but we'll have to see. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, more of a social question here, but I, I always just like to ask this one. Uh, how present or absent were women um, throughout your career? And, and I mean, from start to finish might be very different. But Oh, well, start to finish, yeah, for sure. I mean, I was told when I, I used to come down doing uh, um, interviewing for summer students uh, when I first started with Naranda here in Newfoundland, my uh, district geologist, who was my boss, told me not to. Uh, we could interview women, but uh, we wouldn't hire them. So I made the mistake at one point of telling some of the women we were interviewing that you know they they should apply make sure they go to the ones that would hire them right and of course I got into quite a bit of trouble on that because I'm not supposed to be saying that sort of thing but I was trying to help them saying look I, it's not a, it's not up to me I can't you know I can't make that decision because I have a boss but uh, I in today's world it's it's very thing what we see in most in uh, most uh, earth sciences departments now, you probably see 50-50 and sometimes more than 50-50 women. So it's becoming much more uh, commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, the women can do just about everything that men can do. So, you know, it's, it's mineral exploration. They have, the brains are there, they, they're smart girls, they work hard, and uh, I, you know, you're seeing more and more of that, and I think that's going to continue. A big problem in exploration right now is that nobody's hiring anybody. Yeah. So, you know, is that going to continue? Uh, I'm hoping things will turn around. We have uh, young students now, uh, guys and women, that can't get jobs in, in exploration. So what they're doing, they're working at Tim Hortons, they're working at Sobeys, whatever they can do. And they're graduate geologists, which is, which is terrible at this time. You know, hopefully it'll turn around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cyclical uh, hmm. industry. Uh, what what um, what was the exact reason that was given uh, from just, your boss just, not the to boss hire just women? didn't want to hire women. Well, that was it. Yeah, didn't want them in the camps and didn't want that. So that was the decision. He wouldn't do it. Now there were other companies that were hiring women and, and working with them. You know, had them in, integrated into the camps and stuff like that. You have to make certain provisions if you're going to do that. But it, it, you know, they were doing it. But uh, Naranda at the time was not doing it. At least certainly not in Newfoundland. Yeah. Um. So just to finish off a few closing questions, mm -hmm. uh, what, um, this also can sound like a broad question, but we can split it in half. Uh, what are you proudest of in life? And we could say in life and also professionally. If you like. Well, I think uh, I, the, the thing is with it, when you look at your life overall, I mean, what you, what you, you start off, you, you, you get married, you have a family. So, what you want to do with that is you want to have a family that's happy. You want to have a family that's successful. I mean, I'm talking your kids now. I mean, if, as parents, that's what your job is, to raise kids that move on, become successful, and they, you've done your job, etc. cetera. Um, as I said before, when I was in the early days of mineral exploration, I wasn't home as much as I should have. So it was up to my wife, Kay, to, to do the, the parenting as such, right? And she did a very good job with her kids. So. You know, those are the type of things. I was there as much as I could be, but we just weren't there as much you know, as we should have been. In today's world, we would be there a lot more. And uh, 
So, you know, that's what I'm proud of, I guess, is, is, is having raised two successful kids that, you know, that are, uh, you know, contributing to their country. My daughter lives in the States. My son's here in, in St. John's. Both are, have very good jobs. One's an engineer, the other's, the other's a chiropractor. And, and they both have families of their own, so we have grandchildren, and uh, you know that's that's what is, that's what I'm I guess we're proud of proud of. And uh, and professionally, if you could. Professionally, uh, I guess the fact that uh, that you know it, it's one of those things. You work towards different things. You asked about organizations. I've always believed that organizations are important to our industry, and and there's some of us that believe that there's other people that just have nothing to do with them and they might be members but they really don't do other than that they pay their dues but they don't take part in it. I think you talked about getting the word out on mineral exploration and mining out to people on, on generally being proactive. If we didn't have organizations I don't think that would be done at all. So I think that's very important. Uh, so I'm proud that I've been recognized a number of times through, through different things. I'm a fellow of Geoscientists Canada that was a couple of years ago I got that. Uh, I got a Jubilee medal for, for services to the mining industry. I got, uh, you know, I'm an honorary member of the CIM, uh, Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy, Newfoundland section here, which means, you know, that we get honored every year. We get to go to the dinner free and a few things like that. But, and you get recognized for that. Uh, I got a Distinguished Service Award from the PDAC, uh, you know, for the work I did with them. And the fact that I was president of the PDAC, I guess that's, you know, the biggest mineral exploration uh, group in the world. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's very important to, to, uh, to, when you can say you've been president of an association like that, I think it's very important. I think it's, it, it shows recognition of, of what you put into it. And I, I believe that that's, that's probably the biggest accomplishment on that type of thing. And then on the, on, you know, industry-wide, just doing my own stuff, you know, when I look back at it, sometimes you think, well, I haven't found any big, I haven't found a Boise's Bay, I haven't found some of these things, but I've, I've found things that have created, that have created some wealth, like Telepond, Duck Pond, I've been involved with that, uh, even though I wasn't the only one, I was part of it. Um, I think some of the stuff that I've got in my gold zones south of Brambler will ultimately prove out to be something. Now, whether I'll be involved in it or not, I don't know. Uh, but you know those type of things. So I've had success. And when I look back at it, first of all, you you you, you know they, I'm not recognized as a mine finder uh, like some of the people in this in this country, right? Uh, uh, and I and I, but I, I think I've contributed. I guess that's what I'm saying. And the last question: <clears throat> If you were to speak to someone much younger, I mean, we talked about kids a while ago in the geo center. Uh, so if you were talking to someone much younger, like a, a student, for example. Uh, what would be the most important life lesson or piece of advice you could give them looking forward to their career? That's a difficult one. Uh, I guess it depends at what stage they're at and and how committed they are. Uh, mineral exploration isn't easy. Uh, we've talked about how cyclical it is. Uh, it isn't something that uh, you can start off with. When, when I started out of university, I started with one company, I worked with them for 17 years. I don't see that happening to too many people coming out uh, right now. Uh, first of all, it's difficult to get a job and then it's difficult to maintain that job because the majority of jobs are in the junior companies that are reflective of that cyclical cycle and success oriented. So you might have two or three years work and then all of a sudden you can't raise money. So what do you do? Well, you're probably going to be laid off. Now, as, as you go on with experience and, and that, you will rise up in the ranks. And the higher you get, the less likely you are to get laid off, but companies close. So even presidents get laid off. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. I guess you're gonna, if, you're, if you're gonna stay in mineral exploration, if you're gonna get into it and stay in it, you have to be committed. You have to expect that these things are going to happen and you have to prepare for those. So that means when times are good, you can make very good money but don't spend it all, put it aside, no. uh, plan for these downturns. And even if the downturns don't happen to you specifically, because there are still people working through this really tough time, there are people working and making very good money all the way through. And I, I weathered a number of these in the past. Now this has been an unusually, unusually long and unusually strong and unusually down. Um, <clears throat> but these do happen. 
in our industry because we're commodity driven. Uh, we're cyclical in the sense of commodity prices. We're price takers, not price makers. We can't set the price, so world prices set, set the price. So if copper's down and you're working in a copper deposit or working looking for copper deposit, or if your silver price is down, you're looking for silver deposit, you're going to be affected in some way. So as I say, put, take, when times are good, you'll make very good time, you're very good money. Enjoy life while you're doing it because it's, that's what I like about this. No day was the same. Every day was different. So there's a lot of potential in that, but plan for the future and say, okay, we're going to have some tough times. We've got a plan so we can ride those out. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I don't think so. I think you've covered everything. You've got a pretty good idea where I come from, I think. On stuff. Right on. Well, so, thanks a lot for your time. No problem. Thank you.